Chapter Ten. The next morning Corliss was knocked out of a late bed by Bash, one of Jacob Wells's Indians. He was the bearer of a brief little note from Frona, which contained a request for the mining engineer to come and see her at his first opportunity. That was all that was said, and he pondered over it deeply. What did she wish to say to him? She was still such an unknown quantity, and never so much as now in the light of the day before, that he could not guess did she desire to give him his dismissal on a definite well understood basis to take advantage of her sex and further humiliate him to tell him what she thought of him in coolly considered cold measured terms or was she penitently striving to make amends for the unmerited harshness she had dealt him there was neither contrition nor anger in the note no clue nothing save a formally worded desire to see him so it was in a rather unsettled and curious frame of mind that he walked in upon her as the last hour of the morning drew to a close he was neither on his dignity nor off his attitude being strictly non-committal against the moment she should disclose hers but without beating about the bush in that way of hers which he had come already to admire she at once showed her colours and came frankly forward to him the first glimpse of her face told him the first feel of her hand before she had said a word told him that all was well i am glad you have come she began i could not be at peace with myself until i had seen you and told you how sorry i am for yesterday and how deeply ashamed i there there it's not so bad as all that they were still standing and he took a step nearer to her i assure you i can appreciate your side of it and though looking at it theoretically it was the highest conduct demanding the fullest meed of praise still in all frankness there is much to to yes much to deplore in it from the social standpoint and unhappily we cannot leave the social standpoint out of our reckoning but so far as i may speak for myself you have done nothing to feel sorry for or be ashamed of it is kind of you she cried graciously only it is not true and you know it is not true you know that you acted for the best you know that i hurt you insulted you you know that i behaved like a fishwife and you do know that i disgusted you no no he raised his hand as though to ward from her the blows she dealt herself but yes yes and i have all reason in the world to be ashamed i can only say this in deference the woman had affected me deeply so deeply that i was close to weeping then you came on the scene you know what you did and the sorrow for her bred an indignation against you and well i worked myself into a nervous condition such as i had never experienced in my life it was hysteria i suppose anyway i was not myself we were neither of us ourselves now you are untrue i did wrong but you were yourself as much so then as now but do be seated here we stand as though you were ready to run away at first sign of another outbreak surely you are not so terrible he laughed adroitly pulling his chair into position so that the light fell upon her face rather you are not such a coward i must have been terrible yesterday i-i almost struck you and you were certainly brave when the whip hung over you why you did not even attempt to raise a hand and shield yourself i notice the dogs your whip falls among come nevertheless to lick your hand and to be petted ergo she queried audaciously ergo it all depends he equivocated and notwithstanding i am forgiven as i hope to be forgiven then i am glad only you have done nothing to be forgiven for you acted according to your light and i to mine though it must be acknowledged that mine casts the broader flare ah i have it clapping her hands in delight i was not angry with you yesterday nor did i behave rudely to you or even threaten you it was utterly impersonal the whole of it you simply stood for society for the type which aroused my indignation and anger and as its representative you bore the brunt of it don't you see i see and cleverly put only while you escape the charge of maltreating me yesterday you throw yourself open to it to-day you make me out all that is narrow-minded and mean and despicable which is very unjust 
only a few minutes past i said that your way of looking at it theoretically considered was irreproachable but not so when we include society but you misunderstand me vance listen her hand went out to his and he was content to listen i have always upheld that what is is well i grant the wisdom of the prevailing social judgment in this matter though i deplore it i grant it for the human is so made but i grant it socially only i as an individual choose to regard such things differently and as between individuals so minded why should it not be so regarded don't you see now i find you guilty as between you and me yesterday on the river you did not so regard it you behaved as narrow-mindedly as would have the society you represent then you would preach two doctrines he retaliated one for the elect and one for the herd you would be a democrat in theory and an aristocrat in practice in fact the whole stand you are making is nothing more or less than jesuitical i suppose with the next breath you will be contending that all men are born free and equal with a bundle of natural rights thrown in you are going to have dell bishop work for you by what equal free-born right will he work for you or you suffer him to work no he denied i should have to modify somewhat the questions of equality and rights and if you modify you are lost she exulted for you can only modify in the direction of my position which is neither so jesuitical nor so harsh as you have defined it but don't let us get lost in dialectics i want to see what i can see so tell me about this woman not a very tasteful topic corliss objected but i seek knowledge nor can it be wholesome knowledge frona tapped her foot impatiently and studied him she is very beautiful she suggested do you not think so as beautiful as hell but still beautiful she insisted yes if you will have it so and she is as cruel and hard and hopeless as she is beautiful yet i came upon her alone by the trail her face softened and tears in her eyes and i believe with a woman's ken that i saw a sight of her to which you are blind and so strongly did i see it that when you appeared my mind was blank to all save the solitary wail oh the pity of it the pity of it and she is a woman even as i and i doubt not that we are very much alike why she even quoted browning and last week he cut her short in a single sitting she gambled away thirty thousand of jack dorsey's dust dorsey with two mortgages already on his dump they found him in the snow next morning with one chamber empty in his revolver frona made no reply but walking over to the candle deliberately thrust her finger into the flame then she held it up to corliss that he might see the outraged skin red and angry and so i point the parable the fire is very good but i misuse it and i am punished you forget he objected the fire works in blind obedience to natural law lucille is a free agent that which she has chosen to do that she has done nay it is you who forget for just as surely dorsey was a free agent but you said lucille is that her name i wish i knew her better corliss winced don't you hurt me when you say such things and why pray because because yes because i honour woman highly frona you have always made a stand for frankness and i can now advantage by it it hurts me because of the honour in which i hold you because i cannot bear to see taint approach you why when i saw you and that woman together on the trail i you cannot understand what i suffered taint there was a tightening about her lips which he did not notice and a just perceptible lustre of victory lighted her eyes yes taint contamination he reiterated there are some things which it were not well for a good woman to understand one cannot dabble with mud and remain spotless that opens the field wide she clasped and unclasped her hands gleefully you have said that her name is lucille you display a knowledge of her you have given me facts about her you doubtless retain many which you dare not give in short if one cannot dabble and remain spotless how about you but i am a man of course very good because you are a man you may court contamination 
because i am a woman i may not contamination contaminates does it not then you what do you hear with me out upon you corliss threw up his hands laughingly i give in you are too much for me with your formal logic i can only fall back on the higher logic which you will not recognize which is strength what man wills for woman that will he have i take you then on your own ground she rushed on what of lucille what man has willed that he has said so you and all men have willed since the beginning of time so poor dorsey willed you cannot answer so let me speak something that occurs to me concerning the higher logic which you call strength i have met it before i recognized it in you yesterday on the sleds in me in you when you reached out and clutched at me you could not down the primitive passion and for that matter you did not know it was uppermost but the expression on your face i imagine was very like that of a woman stealing caveman another instant and i am sure you would have laid violent hands upon me then i ask your pardon i did not dream there you go spoiling it all i i quite liked you for it don't you remember i too was a cave woman brandishing the whip over your head but i am not done with you yet sir doubleface even if you have dropped out of the battle her eyes were sparkling mischievously and the wee laughter creases were forming on her cheek i purpose to unmask you as clay in the hands of the potter he responded meekly then you must remember several things first when i was very humble and apologetic you made it easier for me by saying that you could only condemn my conduct on the ground of being socially unwise remember corliss nodded then just after you branded me as jesuitical i turned the conversation to lucille saying that i wished to see what i could see again he nodded and just as i expected i saw for in only a few minutes you began to talk about taint contamination and dabbling in mud and all in relation to me there are your two propositions sir you may only stand on one and i feel sure that you stand on the last one yes i am right you do and you were insincere confess when you found my conduct unwise only from the social point of view i like sincerity yes he began i was unwittingly insincere but i did not know it until further analysis with your help put me straight say what you will frona my conception of woman is such that she should not court defilement but cannot we be as gods knowing good and evil but we are not gods he shook his head sadly only the men are that is new womanish talk he frowned equal rights the ballot and all that oh don't she protested you won't understand me you can't i am no woman's rights creature and i stand not for the new woman but for the new womanhood because i am sincere because i desire to be natural and honest and true and because i am consistent with myself you choose to misunderstand it all and to lay wrong strictures upon me i do try to be consistent and i think i fairly succeed but you can see neither rhyme nor reason in my consistency perhaps it is because you are unused to consistent natural women because more likely you are only familiar with the hot house breeds pretty helpless well-rounded stall fatted little things blissfully innocent and criminally ignorant they are not natural or strong nor can they mother the natural and strong she stopped abruptly they heard somebody enter the hall and a heavy soft moccasin tread approaching we are friends she added hurriedly and corliss answered with his eyes I ain't intrudin am i dave harney grinned broad insinuation and looked about ponderously before coming up to shake hands not at all corliss answered we bored each other till we were pining for someone to come along if you hadn't we would soon have been quarrelling wouldn't we miss wells i don't think he states the situation fairly she smiled back in fact we had already begun to quarrel you do look a mite flustered harney criticized dropping his loose-jointed frame all over the pillows of the lounging couch how's the famine corliss asked any public relief started yet won't need any public relief 
Miss Frona's old man was too four-handed for him. Scart the daylights out of the critters, I do believe. Three thousand went out over the ice, hittin' the high places, and half as many went down to the caches, and the markets loosened some considerable. Just what Wells figured on. Everybody speculated on a rise and held all the grub they could lay hand to. That helped scare the shorts, and away they stampeded for salt water. The whole caboodle had taken all the dogs with them. Say, he sat up solemnly, corner dogs. They'll rise suthin' unheard on in the spring when freightin' gets brisk. I've corralled a hundred already, and I figure to clear a hundred dollars clean on every hide of em. Think so? Think so? I guess yes. Between we three confidential, I'm startin' a couple of lads down in the lower country next week to buy up five hundred of the best huskies they can spot. Think so? I've limbered my giants too long in the land to get caught nappin'. Frona burst out laughing. But you got pinched on the sugar, Dave. Oh, I dunno, he responded complacently. Which reminds me, I've got a newspaper and only four weeks old. The Seattle Post Intelligencer. Has the United States and Spain? Not so fast, not so fast. The long Yankee waved his arms for silence, cutting off Frona's question, which was following fast on that of Corliss. "'But have you read it?' they both demanded. "'Uh-huh. Every line. Advertisements and all.' "'And do tell me,' Frona began, "'has—' "'Now you keep quiet, Miss Frona, till I tell you about it regular. "'That newspaper cost me fifty dollars. "'Caught the man coming in round the bend above Klondike City and bought it on the spot.' That dummy could have got a hundred for it easy, if he'd held on till he made town. But what does it say, has? Easy, I was saying. That newspaper cost me fifty dollars. It's the only one that came in. Everybody's just dying to hear the news. So I invited a select number of em to come here to your parlors tonight, Miss Frona, is the only likely place, and they can read it out loud, by shifts, as long as they want, or till they're tired. That is, if you'll let them have the use of the place. Why, of course, they are welcome, and you are very kind to... He waved her praise away. Just as I calculated, now it so happens, as you said, that I was pinched on sugar. So every mother's son and daughter that gets a squint at that paper tonight got to pony up five cups of sugar. Savvy? Five cups, big cups, white or brown or cube, and I'll take their IOUs and send a boy round to their shacks the day following to collect. Frona's face went blank at the telling. Then the laughter came back into it. Won't it be jolly? I'll do it if it raises a scandal. Tonight, Dave? sure tonight sure and you get a complimentary you know for the loan of your parlor but papa must pay his five cups you must insist upon it dave dave's eyes twinkled appreciatively i'll get it back on him you bet and i'll make him come she promised at the tail of dave harney's chariot sugar cart dave suggested and tomorrow night i'll take the paper down to the opry house won't be fresh then so they can get in cheap a couple be about the right thing i reckon he sat up and cracked his huge knuckles boastfully i ain't been a burnin daylight since navigation closed and if they set up all night they won't be up early enough in the morning to get ahead of dave harney even on a sugar proposition End of chapter 10. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com.